friends in Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. Kindness. We think of kindness, we probably think of a lot of things, don't we? A Christian radio station that we listen to in our house, KJOY 99.1, they often encourage the listeners to practice random acts of kindness. Now, what is a random act of kindness? Well, a random act of kindness is, is something that's neither expected or deserved, but somebody is motivated, in, in this case, by the love of God in Jesus Christ, to do something for someone they do not know and totally unexpected. The illustration I, I put in there is, is one that was very meaningful for Gail and Michael and I. One, one time when I was back from the Middle East and we went out to dinner, we went to lunch at Cracker Barrel when it wasn't crowded and there was a, another couple sitting there and they watching us pretty much the whole meal, you know, and Michael was on his best behavior and I was not. <laughs> and and at, at the end of the meal, you know, I could tell Michael was full and he was ready to go home. So when we asked for the check, the waitress said, well, that, that nice couple that was sitting by you, they paid for your check. And, and I thought to myself, you know, what can I say but thank you? Now tonight we, we remember Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper. Not a random act of kindness, but a meaningful, purposeful act of kindness from the heart of God for each and every one of us. A purposeful act of kindness to give us forgiveness and life and salvation. Now Paul, when he, when he talks about the Lord's Supper and how people would prepare for the, Lord, the Lord's Supper, if you want to read through it in one of his epistles in Corinthians, he talks about uh, eating, eating unworthily, a manducato idiomato. And, and the expression of that is, is, is if we don't take our sins seriously, then how can we take the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our sins seriously? And that's why tonight in our liturgy, we spend a great deal of time, you know, on reflecting on, on what Jesus has done for us and what Jesus will continue to do through us to bring not random acts of kindness, but purposeful, meaningful acts of kindness from, from the heart of God to your heart and then through our hearts to the lives of men, women, and children who do not yet know Jesus Christ. Throughout these nine weeks that I've been here, my sole purpose for being here is, is to bring the love of Jesus Christ and that the Holy Spirit would touch your hearts and the hearts of all of the members of this congregation to reach out to those that, who do not yet know who Jesus Christ is. And if they use his name, they usually use it in vain. I sat and I talked with Dr. Michael today uh, briefly, and he was in here doing some work. And I, I told him after my first week here, I went home and I looked at a map of, of, of the surrounding area. And I looked at the demographics of your church and I just started making notes of how God could take the men, women, and children of this congregation and multiply the ministry through not random acts, but very meaningful purpose acts. Because if, if we truly believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, if we truly believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, if we truly believe that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, then we will go and bear fruit benefit and of what he has done first and foremost for us. And so tonight we want to look at what it means for God's kindness to be in our hearts. Paul speaks elsewhere and he says, love is kind. Kindness acts, does it not? You know, if we look back in the book of Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. Many people in the world today do not love themselves. And if they do not love themselves, how can they love their neighbor as themselves? It's skewed. As Paul says elsewhere, now we see dimly in a mirror and then we will see face to face. But you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God that has come into the world. Because you believe that, you can truly love yourself as God loves you. And all of these nine weeks have been to try to help us get ready not only to celebrate the resurrection from Easter, but after the lilies fade and they're gone and they're used in your compost for the garden, that the purity and the power of God's love for you and Jesus Christ will continue to burn brightly long after I'm gone 
And because that's why we are here as Christian people, God leaves us here on this earth to not practice random acts of kindness, but to be meaningful, purposeful, and focused, focused on what it means to be a Lutheran Christian in a world that so desperately needs to hear the gospel. And so when we look, when we look at the life of Boaz and we, and we look at his interactions with Ruth and Naomi, God had a plan in the midst of that. If you remember Naomi's life, you know, she was destitute and on the edge, and she told her daughters that they should go and find other men because she had nobody to provide for them. And, and in those days, if somebody was a widow and then they had no children, if you remember the widow of Nain, that woman was, when she wept in that funeral procession, she was not only weeping, you know, not only because she was a widow, but she was weeping because the death of her son, that was her only physical means of life and sustenance. So God's plan in working with the faith that Ruth had, because what did Ruth say to Naomi? Whether thou goest, I will go. And God blessed that faithfulness because what happened? One day when she was gleaning in the fields, you know, Boaz saw her and saw that she was stooping and doing manual labor so she could feed the leftovers for herself and for her mother. And God touched the heart and the mind of that wealthy man and something beautiful and powerful happened. Scripture says very clearly, Boaz replied, May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Whose wings are you under? Is it me, myself, and I? Is it our reputations? Is it our investment portfolio? Is it our last name? Or is it Jesus? And then what did Naomi said? The Lord bless him. He has not show, stopped showing his kindness. The kindness that God reaches out and touches your heart and mind with, with Jesus Christ, is not conditional, but it's unconditional. This past Sunday, what, what did we speak of? We spoke that God was love. And in all of our acts and all of our motivations in life, the single motivating factor in our life as Christian people is the love of God and Jesus Christ. And tonight we want to focus again on how the love of God in Jesus Christ is manifested in the kindness that we show one another. Because kindness is a lot like integrity, is it not? What is integrity? That we are the same men and women, whether we're sitting in church in, the, in Sunday, our spouses are, are off on vacation somewhere, or I'm living in the Middle East for four years all by myself, and I'm the same man whether I'm here in this church with you, I'm in the Middle East all by myself, or I'm home with my wife and son. And the same is with integrity and kindness, because kindness manifests itself in how we live and in our acts. And then too, God showed kindness what? Remember when he blessed Boaz and Ruth, and Boaz married Ruth, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to who? A son, and his name was Obed, and he was the father of Jesse, the father of David, the father of, and who was Jesus' earthly father? Joseph who came from that line and lineage. And then Abraham, Abraham again, we see the acts of kindness. Abraham sent his servant to what? To look for a wife. And so he, the servant went into a different country. And who was it that God's, God's heart touched the heart of that servant? He touched the heart of the servant because God found a godly woman for Isaac and Rebekah. And if you remember the story, what did she do? She took care of the servants, she took care of the animals, and God touched that man's heart and opened the eyes of his heart to see that Rebecca was the kind woman that was going to be chosen for Isaac. And then look at Israel. The, it, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills removed, yet my unfailing love will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace, says the Lord who has compassion on you. When we see those kind acts, we see that kindness matters. Who is my neighbor? In today's world, what do, we look, what, what do we think of as our neighbor? Usually the people with the same skin color, the same race, the same religion, maybe the same golf club you're a member of if you play golf, same sports team you cheer for. But see, Jesus came to shake that up. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? As Jesus said, if you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Jesus came first to the, 
to the children of Israel, did he not? But he also came for all humankind. And who were the people that came to him? Were it the children of Israel that came and flocked to him? No, it was the Samaritans, the tax collectors, the sinners. Jesus' sinners will receive. Jesus says, as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. How many times during our lives, during our lives, have we done something because it helps us get promoted, it helps us get ahead? But what did Jesus come to do for us? He came to give us something we could never, never pay it back for. How could we ever pay Jesus back for dying to forgive us our sins and to give us life today and to give us life to come eternally? How can we pay him back? We can never pay him back, but how can we respond? If you have done it to one of the least of these, you have done it unto me. So every man, woman, and child that we meet in our life is an opportunity to witness of the love of God in Jesus Christ. That's why Christians are left on this earth. We don't multiply and grow our church by having children. We grow and multiply by witnessing of our faith to other people. Yes, we have children, we baptize and raise them in the Christian faith. But Christian people witness of their faith. And that's how the church grew then, and that's how the church is going to grow today. And that's how the church is going to grow where I go to serve next. By reaching out with the love of God and Jesus Christ to other people. And then not just to love those that love us, but to love our enemies. Samaritans and Jews, remember, they practiced open hostility with one another. For Jesus, a Jew, to come and speak with the woman at the well. For Jesus to speak with the woman that was caught in adultery. For Jesus to speak with the woman that was the prostitute who washed his feet with her hair and tears. Why did he do that? Because the love of God in Jesus Christ transcends all races, all political parties, all sin, all motivation, all skin color, all everything. And that love from the heart of God to your heart is what makes this world different and what is going to continue to make this world different because kindness matters. It produces generosity. Luke says, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and turn the other cheek. Who did that for us? What did Jesus do and what did he experience for us on the week of passion? He prayed, he blessed those that hated him. When they sat, shouted, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, what did Jesus do? He prayed for them. When they whipped him and beat him and they pulled out his beard, what did he do? He turned the other cheek. When they nailed him to the cross and mocked him and cursed him, what did he do? He prayed for his enemies. He blessed and he did not curse. And the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's not a secular humanistic motivation of doing something to get ahead. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What did Jesus do for us? He died. What did Jesus do for us? He forgave our sins. What did Jesus enable us to do? He enables us to die to ourselves and live to him. He enables us to love those that hate us. He enables us to bless and not curse. He enables us to give and live and forgive. And that's indeed what he calls us to do when he says, Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful. You know, Paul in his preparations and speaking and writing to the church of Corinth and the church at Zion Lutheran Church, when he talks about us and when we have conflict with ourselves and with others, he says, go and make things right with your brother and then come to the altar. And so tonight we've professed and we confessed our sins to God. And in our hearts we ask for forgiveness to one another. And if there's somebody in this congregation or in your family back home, I'd strongly encourage you to find an opportunity to reach out to them and to love them as Jesus loves you and bless them and do not curse them because the life that we have in this world is a gift and how we live our life is a gift back to him. And the Good Samaritan, Jesus shows us what? The perfect example of the golden rule because what did that man do for the man that was beaten and left to die? 
He picked him up. He took him to the inn. He paid for all of his, all of his medical care. And then he said, and if you have any other expenses, I will pay for them myself. What did Jesus Christ do for you? Hmm? What did Jesus Christ do for you? He paid for every one of your sins. He cleansed your heart. He cleansed your mind. And he enables you to do the hardest thing, to forgive yourself. If Jesus says, I remember your sins no more, he's telling you that you can, you can remember them no more also. And as Paul says, I bear in my body the marks of Christ. But well, we are all wounded healers, are we not? But we do not want to wound others as they wound us. Kindness matters. And Jesus became the good Samaritan for us. For in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to fulfill the law on our behalf, that we might receive what? The full right of sons, the adoption of sons. And then we can cry, Abba, Father. When you were little, when your children were little, or you have grandchildren now, and they come to you, and they are bruised and beaten or bullied at school, or they fall and they cut their legs or get a boo-boo, as you call it, what do you do? You take them in your arms, you love them, you wipe their tears, and you kiss them until they feel better. That phrase, Abba, Father, is the very same thing that we can do because the temple curtain was torn in two before us. That we can call our Father, our Daddy, our loving and merciful Father who loves us. And so as we see that Christ has been kind with us, the greatest kindness is that he has forgiven us our sins. Romans 2, 4 states, God's kindness, God's kindness leads us to repentance. When the Holy Spirit touches our hearts and minds and convicts us of our sins, what do we do? We do the very thing we did in our service tonight. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then what does Jesus do? He forgives you your sins and he remembers them no more. And because he forgives us, we can be sure of his forgiveness. As Paul says in Ephesians, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness, expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. And as he has been kind to us, he enables us to live as forgiven people. So many times we go through things in our lives and we feel that we are bitten, stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But who was stricken, smitten, and afflicted for us? Jesus Christ. Jesus was stricken, smitten, and afflicted and hung on the tree. And then the night before he was betrayed, he instituted the Lord's Supper. And he broke bread and he gave thanks and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you for the forgiveness of sin. And then he took the cup and he had supped and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and he said, Drink ye all of it. This, new, this cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Love is kind. Kindness matters. Jesus is kind with us because he gave his life for us. And he calls us to be kind to one another as he clearly states and as he clearly lived for you and for me. As you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. As we receive his Lord's Supper tonight, may we be strengthened in our faith. May we be convicted to be his lights, to be his ambassadors, to be his bread and to bring his body, a healing, loving body in his church, in his community, in the name of Jesus who gave his life so that we will never die. Amen.